Amen. So in Psalm chapter 3, of course, this is important always to take note of when this psalm was written. And if you notice there, it probably says right there at the top of your Bible, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So this was later in David's life when he wrote this. This was during, uh, when, after Absalom, had, uh, you know, the uprising of Absalom, the uh, insurrection that he made, the civil war that ensued when uh, he was fleeing from his son. So that's the context in which this is written. And of course, that you know, plays a big part into you know, how we can apply this passage tonight. But the first thing I want us to notice there in verse 1, it says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. And what we can take from this is the fact that, you know, you are going to have trouble in the Christian life. And in fact, there's going to be times in life when trouble is increased. And it's interesting that he says, you know, how, you know, how are they, uh, you know, he didn't say anything to the effect that, boy, this, this trouble is a new concept to me. Boy, trouble in my life is something that I've never experienced before up until now. No, he said trouble was increased. You know, those that trouble him were multiplied. And what we can take from this is the fact that, you know, in, just in life in general, there's going to be a minimum amount of trouble. You know, even, even for the unsaved, you know, even people who don't have Christ as their Savior, who aren't trying to live for the Lord, you know, it's not as if we can, you know, they live life without any kind of trouble. You know, in fact, you know, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And we know that oftentimes, you know, they have quite a bit of trouble. But what we can take from this is the fact that, you know, we're all going, we're all going to have some minimum amount of trouble, everybody. And there's going to be times, in fact, when trouble is increased, when we have more trouble than we normally would. There's, the, you know, the ordinary troubles and trials that everybody kind of goes through in life, all the different things that everybody goes through. But then there's also times, or specific, more specifically, people, certain people that have more trouble than others. You know, not everybody had the trouble that David had. Not everybody went through everything that David went through. And <coughs> what we could, you know, we should just understand that life is going to have its own amount of trouble. Being a Christian isn't always going to mean that everything is so much the better, right? And, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to not talk about, you know, what's going on in our world today. Obviously, you know, we just had this election take place and we assume that it's over. You know, they who knows what's going to happen and how ugly this is going to get with, you know, uh, the lawsuits and everything like that. Again, I'll just say it. You know, I don't have a dog in this fight. It really doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm I feel very liberated having not participated. OK, and you can like that or not like that. That's another subject. But that's the stance that I take. Um, you know, I'm not going to get up and go on and on about that, but mark it down. You know, we do have, a, you know, as of now, it looks like we have a new president. And I'm not saying this to say that, you know, the president we had was so great or try to lift him up. I'm not lamenting the fact that, you know, that, that uh, this is taking place. I'm not praising it either. I'm pretty neutral in the whole thing. But what we can take it to the bank is this, is that the outcome of this election is likely to increase our trouble as Christians. You know, I think that is something we need to at least look at what's going on in the world and say, okay, how is this going to affect us as Christians? You know, because for a long time, they've kind of had Donald Trump, you know, as their, as their main guy that they're going to go after. You know, and they had a, a you know, a quote-unquote conservative in the White House. They had somebody that was apparently, you know, I don't really know how much he was standing up for conservative values or anything like that. But the world certainly perceived it that way and kind of made him their enemy. And now that they have a very liberal person in the White House, you know, now they're going to feel free, like, okay, let's go back to, you know, persecuting people who won't, you know, bake cakes for fags and so on and forth like that. That's now it's back to going after conservative Americans. Not that that came to a dead halt anyway. But, you know, you can count, that's probably something that's going to happen, that, that there will be trouble increased, you know, in the Christian life to some degree or another. But the silver lining is this, you know, the silver lining is, is that, you know, it's good when trouble increases often for God's people. You know, hopefully this means that these preachers that have been just kind of sitting back in their laurels and not really preaching hard because it was their guy in the White House, you know, they don't want to preach on the homos and everything because, you know, their guy in the White House was pro-homo. Newsflash. You know, he's, I saw a pride, I saw a pride Trump sticker on the way down here last week. I've been sent messages like where he, there's, there's pride campaigns in, in support of Trump. So don't tell me the guy is, you know, anti-homo because he's not. He's for it. He's, he's not, nothing's changed there. And I've, I know I've already preached about that and gone on and on about it. But hopefully that would mean that because 
their guy is out of the White House now, maybe they could stand up and start preaching on some things that really matter without looking like a total hypocrite. That's the silver lining. You know, and I'll take that. If it means we have to have, you know, some guy like Biden, you know, Joe and the hoe in the White House, as I've heard stated, which is an accurate dis- depiction of that woman, description of that woman, anyone who prostitutes themselves for money or, or you know, uh, a promotion or a position is a whore. Okay, that's what she is. Amen. Joe and the hoe. If it means we have to have Joe and the hoe in the White House, and, you know, it's four more years, you, might, you don't like that term, you might as well just get used to it, okay? That's a biblical term. I'm abbreviating the word whore, which is all throughout Scripture, okay? So, if me, having to have two people like that in the White House is what it takes to get God's people to stand up behind some pulpits and actually rip some face on some things that actually matter, I'll take it. Amen. Give it to me. I'll take, that for, I'll take that every single election. What about church attendance? You know, maybe maybe uh, this election will turn our country into more of a financial downturn. Maybe people will start to worry more or think the end is near or they'll be all freaked out because we have these incredibly liberal people in the White House. Maybe they'll actually start coming to church. Maybe they'll actually seek after God. This is all good things. But often these things have to come at the expense of being comfortable with, or you know, at the expense of having to have trouble increase in some other way. That's why it's called the silver lining, right? And you say, well, I don't know. I mean, how bad could it really get? Well, the Bible says that the wicked walk on every side when the vilest of men are exalted. That's what it says in Psalms 12. You know, we're going to be there in a little bit, a few weeks. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And I'm not saying, you know, that, oh, Joe Biden is the vilest man and, and Donald Trump was the, you know, the ideal alternate. You know, he's still the lesser of two evil, but that still makes him evil, okay? I'm not, I'm not promoting him either, but I am just saying when the worst of people are exalted in this country, vi- you know, the wicked people rise up. People are emboldened in their wickedness. But here we see he's saying, look, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? The many are they that rise up against me. Trouble is going to be increased. Because there's, and that would, you know, indi- you know, that would, you know, insinuate that there is a minimum level of trouble in life. Just, to, just life in general. And then there's times in life when life is even more difficult. You know, and it also shows us that trouble is going to find us without any help. You know, you're not going to have to go looking for trouble. As this, you know, trouble seems to find the Christian often with, with us. Go over to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. You know, and this is something that, you know, uh, I feel like I'm kind of beating the same drum over and over again about persecution and being in trouble. But this is where the scripture has been taking us. And I think it's important because, you know, we are living in a time which, you know, is, is, is for the most part, we have peace. We're not persecuted to the, the degree others have been. But it very well may be that things are going to get worse, that trouble is going to increase, that those that rise up against us are going to increase. We don't know what lies around the corner. And it's always good to be prepared. It's always good to remind the generations that are coming, that are coming up under the sound of this preaching that they're very, you may very well be the generation that goes through tribulation, or your children, or your grandchildren, and so on and so forth. We have to continue to, to sound this message out that the Christian life is a life of tribulation and trouble. It's a guarantee. The Bible says, you're in John 16, but it says in Matthew 5, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. This is Jesus speaking. He says there, he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. You know, we like the sound of that, right? The sun rising on us. You know, we like nice, bright, sunshiny days. Although in Tucson, I've, I've never seeing people get so excited about overcast days. Someone was talking this morning like, man, we woke up yesterday and the clouds were out. It was overcast. It was great. Now, I'm from a part of the country where it's like that every day for literally months on end where you don't even see the sun sometimes for but maybe a few minutes. People forget what it looks like. They're like, what's that giant glowing orb in the sky? And then they're like, oh, it's the sun, right? They think they're being abducted or something. <coughs> but, you know, generally speaking, you know, the idea of the sun rising on somebody is an is, is is idea of a blessing, of something good coming upon people, right? And he says here, look, he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good. You know, we, there, we share certain things in common with the unsaved. 
there are certain troubles and certain blessings, certain tribulations that we all kind of have in common, just as, as mankind, just living life. And he says, and he, sendeth rain, and he sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. And you could say, well, rain's a blessing. You need rain, right? But, should, you know, Job t said to his wife, shall we receive evil of, uh, good of the Lord and not evil also? And he's saying, look, it's a mixed bag in life. You can't, you can't have it. Don't expect life to just be all good all the time. There's going to be times when trouble is increased. There's going to be times when it's not just sunshine. There's, the rain is going to come too. You know, this is just the way life works. And Christians today, they're not, they're, they, don't, they seem to have lost sight of this. They seem to think that, well, once I get saved, life is just going to be easy. That should make life easier, right? Is that what David went through? I mean, we're, we're reading about the, the early, you know, the beginnings of David in our study through 1 Samuel, and it, it's not off to an easy start for, for David here. I mean, he's already on the flea. He's already had, you know, javelins thrown at him. He's running for his life, so on and so forth. You're there in John chapter 16, look at verse 33. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah, he said, these things have I spoken unto you that you have my peace. You know what's going to give you peace in this world? The things that he has spoken. The Bible. That's what's going to give you peace in this world. In this world. <laughs> in the world, ye shall have tribulation. Be of, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Look, that's a promise. And Jesus isn't just being overly dramatic here. He's telling me, look, you're going to have tribulation in the world. It's going to come to you in different forms. You're go there's going to be times in this life where trouble is increased. And there's just so many verses about this. Acts 14, he reminded them we mu that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Look, our journey to heaven, our way to heaven, this life that we live as we enter into the kingdom of God, is not going to be just a life of ease and comfort. There's going to be times when we go through much tribulation. Psalms 34, verse 19, the Bible says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them, all, delivereth them out of them all. You know, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But so many, so many people today, so many have this backwards. So many preachers want to get up today and tell people the complete opposite. And that if you experience any tribulation, if you're having any trouble, there must be something wrong with you. You must not be right with God. But Jesus, you know, that's not the case because Jesus has told us we're going to have tribulation in this world. Paul warned us that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And the psalmist, he wrote there that many of the flick are the afflictions of the righteous. You know, go tell that to Job. Oh, he must have done, that was the whole argument in Job with his three friends. You must have done something wrong, Job. I've done nothing wrong. That was the whole argument. Now, what's, you know, again, you have to take it in con with David's trouble here in context of the scripture, Okay. Because you have to, you know, David's trouble came from in the form of, a, you know, personal opposition from within his own house. His own son Absalom is the one that's causing him trouble. And, you know, we could take several things from this before we really talk about exactly why that was. But this will be the case for us, too. This will be the case for the Christian, too. You, as a Christian, are in all likelihood going to have trouble from within your own house. I'm saying immediate relatives. People that are your closest, sons, fathers, wives, husbands, daughter, you know, all of these very close relationships. I'm not saying every single one of them is going to be that way, but I, I can mark, you can just mark it down that you are going to have trouble in your own house from somebody who's close to you often. I should, did you keep something in John? I should have had to go over to uh, Matthew chapter 10. If you want to turn there, you may. I'll begin reading in verse 34. It says, this is a very familiar passage. Jesus said, Think not I am come to send peace on the earth. Well, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean you're not come to send peace? That's what he said. People have this misconstrued idea about who Jesus is and what his purpose was in coming here. He said, I am not come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to send a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. David's a perfect example of that. Somebody who's trying to usurp his authority, take his, even take his life and kill him is of his own household, his own son. And you say, and people, you know, this makes or breaks people. People run into this, and I've seen people, they run into this 
where people, everyone's okay with you going to church and living the Christian life, but once they find out more about what you believe, once the times, you know, the times comes time to actually take a stand for Jesus, then opposition comes. Then people within their own house say, you've gone too far, you're crazy, you've lost it. And a lot of times when that happens, that's when people say, I'm not willing to pay this price. I'm not saying you're not saved anymore. They just say, you know what? I'm just not going to, I'm going to find a watered down, weak church where they're just going to, it's all going to just be nice. And everyone's going to play nice and the preacher's never going to get upset or anything and they're not, I'm not going to have to make any big decisions in my life. And Jesus sees it coming. Look at verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, I'd follow Jesus. I'd go all the way with him, but you know, it's upsetting my parents. Then you're not worthy. Oh, I love God. I'd love to follow him. I would, I'd do anything for the Lord, but you know, it upsets my wife. Not worthy. Oh, I'd follow God. I'd, I'd, I'd give everything to him. I want to serve him with my whole life, but I don't want to upset anybody in my own house. Then you're not worthy of him because that's the price that we have to pay because there are times in the christian life when trouble is increased often from within our own house now the thing about david you kind of have to have you know there's an asterisk here with him because of the fact that david if you would go to second samuel chapter 12 and remind us of this david brought this own trouble upon his own head david brought this trouble upon his own head okay this was something that God said was going to happen because of his own sin. <clears throat> Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. This is right after you know, he gets, he's getting called out for his sin with Bathsheba where he committed adultery and had her husband murdered. Which are wicked things. Okay? And, and in verse 7 it says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And that's what we're reading about on Thursdays. <clears throat> now, did David, David did nothing to warrant the wrath of Saul and, 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 and the, the, the trouble that resulted, did he? David, when, when he was going through trouble with Saul, you know, he suffered innocently. You know, he was just trying to do what was right. As we saw this last week, even the, you know, Ahimelech, the, the priest, said, Who is so faithful in all thine house is David. And that's what Dave, that was David's testimony. When David suffered at the hands of Saul, when trouble was increased with Saul, it wasn't his fault. That was just him suffering for righteousness' sake. He was being buffeted for Christ's sake and not for his own faults. <clears throat> but however, his trouble with Absalom is the result of his own actions. Look there at verse 8. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such things, such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in the sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them to thy neighbor. And that's, a, that's, that's him prophesying and telling him of Absalom, of what was going to take place. So what we see here is that trouble is going to be increased as a Christian. You know, David suffered at the hands of Saul innocently, but then later, because of his own actions, God judges him and the trouble is increased, not because of his righteousness, but because of his sin. <clears throat> and what that should tell us is that, you know, life has enough trouble as it is. We don't need to go compounding the trouble in life, let alone the Christian life. Yea, all they that live God in Christ Jesus shall, per shall suffer persecution. We understand that, that that's a guarantee. We don't need to go making it worse by getting involved in sin, by bringing in the judgment of God upon our lives. You don't need to compound life's trouble, let alone the Christian life's trouble, by sinning. If you would, go back there to uh, Psalms chapter 3. We're going to look at, we can pick it back up in verse 2. He said there in verse 2, Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for God in him, Selah. So he's saying, look, many are increased, many there are that trouble in me, and what are these people, how are they troubling him? Well, they're saying of his soul that there is no God for help, help for God in, uh, for him and God. 
And often, you know, the way people want to trouble us today as Christians is they want to discourage us. They want us to, to not think that we're doing the right thing. You know, and this is, you know, Jesus had this problem. People tell, you know, told him, you know, when they crucified him, come down from the cross, save thyself, and we will believe. He saved others himself, he cannot save. What are they discouraging? Tell them, oh, God's not with you. God's not on your side. There's no help for God for you. There's no help from him. You know, and sometimes we see other people going through trials. Sometimes we see other people going through hard times in their life. And we better not be like these people and say, oh, God must be judging them. Because God tries his servants. God allows us to go through trials in the Christian life. So don't mistake a trial for God's judgment, even if you're the one going through it. Sometimes we go through a trial in life, we don't understand, we say, what's going on? Why is everything difficult? Why is everything hard? Why am I having to go through this trial in my, in my life? Is God mad at me? Well, you know, maybe you should do what, maybe you need to be a, a little self-check, you know, take some inventory. Maybe if David had stopped and said, well, you know, I did do that. God did tell me this is what's going to happen. And clearly he understood that. He believed God. That didn't stop him from praying and crying out to God and ask for mercy. But not every time when you, when you go through trials and tribulations is it because you've sinned like David. But there are times, you know, maybe if we are having a hard time of it, things aren't going right, maybe we need to step back and say, well, am I doing something wrong? Maybe it's something I'm not doing. And on the, other, the, flip, hand, on the, on the flip side of that, you know, don't mistake prosperity for God's blessing. Go over to Psalm 73, if you would. Psalm 73. A lot of people, you know, they get discouraged by this. Like the psalmist in, in Psalm 73. They see the prosperity of the wicked and they say, well, I must be doing something wrong. Why am I having so much trouble as a Christian? Well, I'm the one who says he loves the Bible. I'm the one that's serving God. I'm the one that's going to church. I'm the one that's doing all the things that God wants me to do. Why am I going through all this trouble? Don't mistake prosperity for God's blessing. <clears throat> Look at Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. And he's discouraged. He's slipping. He's falling away. Why? Verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He's slipping. His steps are well, are, 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 are well nigh slipped. You know, he's falling. His feet were almost gone. He's struggling to make it through life. He's having a hard time. And then he looks at the wicked and he becomes envious. When he sees the prosperity of the wicked. Look at verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They, they seem strong. Look at verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. They don't seem to have the problems that I have. Therefore pride cometh them, cometh them about as a chain with violence, covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. See, he's making a classic blunder in the Christian life that we, we struggle, we go through these trials, we go through these difficulties. And the last thing you want to do when you're going through that is compare yourself to other people who aren't having the same trials that you are because that just might lead you to becoming envious. And he goes on later in that psalm, I don't have it there, but he says, until I went into the sanctuary of my God, then understood I their end. So he resolves the issue by getting in the house of God, and he comes to understand, look, I know what their end is. Oh, their strength's firm today. They're not in trouble as other men are, but they're going to have trouble one day. They're going to have difficulties later on. That's when God judges the wicked. But they want to, you know, we can get discouraged if we mistake God's trial for God's judgment. We can get discouraged if we mistake prosperity for God's blessing. It's not always the case. <clears throat> and a lot of people today, they want to discourage us, they want to trouble us by telling us that there is no help of God, that God is not with us, that in some way God does not agree with us or God does not approve of what we're saying or doing. And the perfect example of this, of course, is the judge not crowd. You know how many times I've heard that over the years. You see, hear some preacher preach some sermon right out of the Bible, judge not call out some particular group of people, call out a particular person for what they are, pointing out the error, the sin, the wickedness. Judge not. Oh, Jesus said not to judge. 
He said to judge not according to appearance, but to judge righteous judgment. He said, judge not unless ye be judged. He's saying, don't be a hypocrite. He didn't say, don't judge at all. He said, if you're going to judge somebody, you better make sure, like we read this morning, that you don't have a beam in your own eye. He said, take out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. He's still saying, judge, just make sure you're doing it right. And not be a hypocrite when you're doing it. Not, don't judge at all. But that's the crowd that they love that. They cling, that's like the one Bible verse they know. Judge not. They should just keep on reading. Why do they say that? Why do they say judge not? They want to discourage us. They want to tell you, you don't know the Bible. You don't know what God really thinks. You don't know. You, you Christians, you, you don't live like you're Christ. Oh, how very godly of you. How Christian of you. That's not what Jesus would do. How do you know what Jesus would do? You've never even read the Bible. You don't have the Spirit of God. But that's, that's what they like to do. They like to discourage us by trying to tell us that God is not with us, that God does not approve of what we're doing. But make no mistake, God is with us. God is with us. Nothing shall separate us from the love that which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. He said, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. That's what David understood. If you want to go back to Psalm 3, he said there, in verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. He didn't say, you know what, Lord, I'm beginning to think that they're right, that there really is no help for me. He didn't lose his confidence. He didn't become discouraged. He didn't let that get to him. He said, but thou, art, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. And I love the way that he describes the Lord. He describes him as a shield. He says, Lord, thou art a shield for me. You know, the, a shield is a defensive weapon. You know, sometimes in the Christian life, all the, the best you can hope to do is just hunker down and, and bear it and use that shield that God has given us and wait for the, the fiery darts of the wicked to, to stop firing so much to then we press on. The last thing we ever want to do in the Christian life is back up. But you know, sometimes in the Christian life, it's okay to just hold your ground. Maybe we're not making the progress we wanted to make. Maybe we're not charging forward like we want to and taking you know, the stronghold after stronghold and victory after victory, maybe we run into a lot of opposition. And sometimes it's okay to just hold your ground and let the Lord be a shield for you. That's, what, that's part of the armor in Ephesians 6. That famous passage, above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darks of the wicked. <clears throat> you know, the Lord is a shield. In Ephesians 6, it's a field, the, the shield of faith. That shield that we have in the Lord is a shield that we use by faith. And how do you do that? How do you use this shield by faith? Well, we trust in the promises of God's word. That's the shield that he's referring to. The promises in God's word that I will never leave thee, that I will never forsake thee, that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what, men shall do unto, what man shall do unto me. That is the shield that we use God's word. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. You know, if we put our trust in this word and, and trust in God's promises and understand what it says by faith, that's the shield that we hold up. That's how we hold our ground. <coughs> we, here's the thing. You, you don't need a shield if, if you're never under attack. Your, your faith is tested by trials. I mean, if, you never, if the Christian life is a life of ease, there's no trials, there's no tribulations, what's the, what, what do you need a shield for? What do we even need the promises of God for? Why do we need to hear, I will never leave thee or, nor never, or forsake thee? That no man shall be able to pluck them out of my hand. What, what does it matter if no one's trying to pluck us out of his hand? If nobody's trying to oppose us in the Christian life. Look, our faith is tested by trials. Without persecution, there is no point to the promise. Without persecution, there is no point to the promise. That God is a shield unto us. If you would, look at verse 4. He said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. 
you know, God, David here is showing us what faith in God's promises look like. Right? It's one of the things, oh, I understand God's word is a shield to me. I understand that the promises of God are for me and that when, thing, when troubles increase, when I go through trials and tribulations, that's the time for me by faith to, rel- to, to rely and rest on the, the promises of God. I understand that. But what does that actually look like when a person does that? What does it actually look like when you get put in a position in life where you actually have to rely on the promises of God? I think David shows us that in verse 4. He says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I mean, he's crying out. You know, I don't, I don't know that's something, that's probably not how you have your daily devotionals. I don't know that any of us is getting up in the morning and reading our Bible and going to pray and just crying out unto God and waking up the whole house. Well, you know, I just, you know, I was just praying. Maybe, maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you are going something. So maybe you do. But I, I don't think that's an everyday prayer. People where people just cry out to God. But you know, there's times, there's seasons in life when we, when trouble is increased, when we are going through difficulties. That's the time to rely on God as a shield. And what does that look like when a person does that? They cry unto God by faith, because it's a shield that we we use. By faith. And if we believe God is there and we have faith in Him, why would we not cry unto Him? If we really believe the promises of God and that God is real, why would we not cry unto Him? It reminds me of that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Grief to Bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what, pain we, uh, what, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Sometimes we don't wield that. We leave that shield just sitting there. And we're trying to dodge these darts, these fiery darts that are coming in. And we're getting clipped. We're getting stuck. We're getting burned. And we we wonder why. It's because we haven't taken the time to go over by faith and pick up the shield and read it and, and believe it and lean on it and cry unto God. David is showing us what faith in God's promise looks like. Crying out to the only one who can help. If we really believed that there was a balm in Gilead, that there really was a physician, why would we not cry out for it? Look at verse 5. He said, I lay me down and I slept. I awaked and the Lord sustained me. That must have been, that was probably some sweet rest that he had. He said in another psalm, Thou preparest a table for me in the midst of mine enemies. You know, he's in a battlefield where there's just people trying to kill him, and God just says, sit down and eat, son. I got this. We like that part. We like the part about laying down and sleeping and having rest and peace. But how did he get there? You know, look, verse 5 comes after verse 4. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And that's when God, that's when he had the peace. It's after that. <clears throat> and it's interesting with David in the psalm because again trouble was increased but we have to remember that it was trouble that David brought upon his own head and this is an important thing to remember because we can apply it to our own lives you know Absalom's rebellion was the Lord's judgment upon David you, you can't deny that but the Lord still heard David the Lord still listened to David's prayer and gave him peace Lord, they're, 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 they're increased that trouble me. Many are those which rise up against me. Yeah, I know, David, I sent them because of what you did. I told you this is what was going to happen. I said I was going to judge you. And he goes through that trial, and then he cries unto the Lord. And what, well, how did the Lord respond in this, in this song? Yeah, David, you can cry all you want, buddy, but I'm the one that did this, and you deserve every bit of that you're getting. Let's not forget who committed adultery. Let's not forget who killed Uriah the Hittite. You brought this upon your own head. Go ahead and suffer. Was that God's attitude? Look, if that was God's attitude, how can you look at verse (laughs) 5? How could David say, I laid me down and slept, I awaked, and for the the Lord sustained me? No, God said, you know what, David? I did send this judgment. I did bring this into your life. You do deserve it, but I hear your cry. I see what you're going through. I know that you're in trouble you know what, and I still love you, I forgive you, I'll still give you mercy, even in the midst of my judgment. 
And Absalom's rebellion was the Lord's judgment upon David, but the Lord still heard David's prayer and gave him peace. You know, that's an important thing to remember because none of us in this room is perfect. <laughs> Last I checked, if you're anything like me, imperfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things that upset the Lord. We might even be, you know, do things where God has to judge us and chasten us and deal with us. It's nice to know that even when we're going through that, if we would just cry out to God, He'll still hear us. And He'll still give us peace. And He'll still help us. And that there's an end to it. Now, I don't think that, David, that, that God did that for no reason. I believe that God gave David that peace, that God answered that prayer for David because of David's previous actions, because of who David was. <clears throat> In 2 Samuel chapter 22, I'll just read to you. It says in verse 1, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hands of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. So when he finally gets delivered from Saul once and, once and for all, he sings this song. And part of the song in verse 26, he says, With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. You want to know why I believe David got the peace that he got from God when he was going through his well-deserved judgment? Why even when he did all those wicked things that God judged him for, he was still able to cry unto the Lord and get mercy? It's because he's the type of man who in times past had shown mercy. Because he understood this concept all the way back when he was still coming into his kingdom, when he was first coming into to being king of Israel. That with a merciful man thou wilt show thyself merciful. You know what that tells me is that even merciful men need mercy. And what that tells me is that we all need mercy. And look, we're going to need mercy one day. And, we're gonna, we're, and I, we are going to need it. And I'm just saying this, that if you want it, when you need it, you need to learn to show mercy right now. That's why David got it all the way back then. He got delivered out of the hands of the enemies of Saul. And he said, thou will show thyself merciful. And you can't say that David was anything but merciful unto Saul. You know, as we've been re going through that book, you know, we haven't gotten into it yet, but it's coming up soon where David has had more than one opportunity to just take Saul's life. And he says, I will not stretch my hand against the Lord's anointed. And even in Saul's death, he mourns and weeps. Why? Because he's a merciful man. And he under understands this, that one day he's going to need mercy. And sure enough, one day God's judging him. And he cries out, and God says, you know what, David? You've been merciful. I'll give you mercy, too. I'll give you peace. <laughs> not, that we, not that David didn't go through anything. David still had the trouble that he had. That was going to come, sure, sure enough. That wasn't the mercy. Oh, you know what? I changed my mind about Absalom. Everything's going to be fine. No, that when that comes, I will still hear you. I will still help you. I will still be with you. That's the mercy. <laughs> That's why he's able to say in verse 6 of Psalms 3, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Now, is that just David waxing eloquent? Is that David just boasting? I believe David actually believed that. I believe that's the truth. I mean, you can see it in David's life. I mean, he's the one that went and slew Goliath. He was the one that went when all the other armies of Israel were hiding and cowering behind the trees. He went out down in that valley and stood out in front of all the enemies, uh, the, the, the armies, the en armies of the enemy and took on that giant. He is not afraid. And now he's been through so many other trials and tribulations. He's able to say here at the end, toward the, near, the, the, the latter end of his life, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. That's the confidence that he had in God even when God is judging him for his sin. Because he knew that God is a merciful and long-suffering God. And he's been through these trials before, and this is something that we should all understand tonight. Go to, go to Romans 5. Last place we'll turn tonight before we go back to Psalms. In Romans 5. Say, what made David so bold to be able to say that? I mean, can we say that? I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. I'm not going to stand up here and say that I'd be that bold to say that. 
I think that'd be a pretty intimidating sight to have 10,000 people stand against you. To have a standing army coming against you. That'd be frightening. And it seems like people who boast the most are the ones who run, turn, end up tucking tail and running away. The ones that say, oh, I, these sodomites, they won't scare me. A few hundred protesters show up for a few weeks, a few months, whatever, and then they're gone. They're gone the first Sunday. I've, seen, I've, I've heard that hap- of that happening in churches. <coughs> David is bold here because he's been through these similar trials before, and this is what you need to understand about when you go through a trial. You need to go through it because that's what's going to make you bold in the faith. Because you realize something when you go through a trial that it comes to an end. It's scary when you're going into it and you're going to some tribulation or some trial. You don't know how things are going to turn out. But then if you're faithful and you stay through it and you get to the other side, you're emboldened for the next one. Because there's always going to be a next one in the Christian life. Look at Romans 5, verse 3. And he said, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. He didn't say we glory after tribulation. He said we can glory in them. When's the time to glory in tribulation? Or to glory? It's when you're going through tribulation. That's why Jesus said, Count it all joy when men shall persecute you and shall say all manner evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your word in heaven. He said to do that, to rejoice, to leap for joy when men persecute you, not after. When they do. When that happens, that's the time to glory. It's in tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. You go through that tribulation, you glory through it, you make it through, you come out on their side, then when the next one comes, you have patience. You say, oh, I remember this. I've been through this before. All we got to do is tough it out and wait it out. And I have experience. You get more experience. And then when the more experience you have of going through these things, you have hope. You know, I, 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 I was thinking about this, uh, you know, when I went up to that trip to Yakima and I saw the protesters out in front of Pastor Aaron Thompson's church because someone had the audacity to go and leave an invite on a sodomite's door. And they didn't appreciate the fact that it said that they were going to go to hell without Jesus. So about a dozen of them turned up. You know, and, and, and I'm not trying to cast shade on anybody up there. I remember what it was like the first time I had protesters show up at our church, you know, up in Faithful Word. You know, if you've never been through that before, it can be kind of intimidating to have people out there waving signs, drawing attention to you, saying all kinds of mean things, nasty things trying to discourage you, tell you you're wrong, you shouldn't judge, so on and so forth. But you know, I'd been through that a couple times when I was there guest preaching that day. I think it was that day. Maybe it was the following guy. It was both weekends, I think. I remember walking up there and thinking, oh, this is cool. Uh, this is a good time. And you know, probably there are other guys who've never gone through it before. I felt the same way. There are probably people that weren't shaking. But I guarantee you, there probably were some people that got some butterflies in their stomach. Some palms started to sweat. And going to church was a little bit harder that day because these sodomites are right there outside the door. But I mean, when you go through that a few times, you know, that kind of thing, and you can apply this to anything in life, not just protesters. You can apply this to any tribulation that you go through, any trouble that you go through. If you go through it and you get through it, you find out, oh, that I made it, I'm still alive. Then when the next one comes, you say, well, here we go again. I have experience. And what do you have at the end of the day? You have hope. That you're going to make it through and you're going to be just fine. Like David. David at this point in his life has just been after trial, after trial, uprising, after uprising. Hunted by Saul. Facing giants. Fighting the army of the enemies of the Lord. And then he has this uprising in his own, from his own son. And he's able to say, I will not be afraid of 10,000 people. Why? Because the Lord's with me. Because he is my shield. Because he has shown me mercy. And all I'm saying this is, tonight is this, is that don't jump, jump ship when the waves come. Look, you want that hope, don't you? Look at how it ends there in verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. That sounds nice, doesn't it? To have the love of God spread abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Oh, we would all love to have that. That comes through hope. But that hope comes through experience and that experience comes through patience and that patience comes through tribulations and you can't have one without the other so if you want that peace then you have to then don't jump ship 
when the waves come. Weather the storm. Look at verse 7. We'll, we'll wrap it up here if you want to go back to Psalms chapter 3. He says in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And that is exactly what God has done to David's enemies in the past. And that's what he is praying will be done to his, his enemy at this current time. And that is exactly what God does. He doesn't exactly smack him on the face so hard that he breaks his teeth. Obviously, it's a figure of speech. But we know it didn't end well for Absalom. That he was thrust through with a dart. That he got his hair cut in that tree and he got pulled off his own animal. And he's just here swinging by his hair. And just everybody comes and kills him. But what's interesting about that is that, God, that David is going through this trial and he prays this prayer. He asks God for help and he doesn't just say, God, deliver me. He says, he's saying, look, deliver me because thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. He wants God to smite his enemies. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's biblical. But notice, I want to point out the fact that when that happened, David did not rejoice when his enemy fell. And you can say, well, maybe he was wrong for doing that. Oh, I don't know. The Bible says, the Lord said, I have, no, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that he should turn from his wicked ways. Look, it's great when God delivers us. It's great when the wicked are punished for their evil deeds, but it, it's not necessarily something that we should be happy about. David did not rejoice when his enemy fell, but he mourned the loss of his son. I won't take the time to turn us there, but in 2 Samuel 18, when this, after this story plays out, after this psalm has been written, and after Absalom is dead, and God has delivered him, David, out of his hand, he cries. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, my son! Would God that I had died for thee, Absalom, my son, my son. His enemy, the one who wanted to kill him, the one who wanted to take his kingdom from him, who committed rebellion, who he prayed that God would smite. And when he finally did, did he, did he, did he have a big parade? Did he cake and ice cream for everybody afterwards? No, he's lamenting, he's mourning. Look, it's great when God delivers his people. You know, but the Bible says to, to not rejoice when your enemy falleth. You know, sometimes, and, we, and in the flesh, we want to. I told you so. I told them they had it coming. And all the rest of you enemies, mark it down. That's what happens when you mess with us. That's the, that's the flesh. We wanted you to just keep that in and think about the fact, you know what would have been a lot better is if Absalom had never done what he did. That would have been the ideal outcome. Look at verse 8. He says, Salvation belongeth unto God, excuse me, unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. That's the only place you can turn to when trouble arises. Look, that's the only place you can go for salvation. When trouble is increased, the, the, the arm of flesh will fail you. Don't, don't be like, don't, you know, Old Testament Israel trying to go run back to Egypt. Don't run back to the world and expect them to help you. They're not, there is no deliverance there. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. You've got to go through Him. So God, you know, He will show us mercy. And that's great, isn't it? That God will be merciful unto the merciful, even when we are responsible for the situation that we're in. That's, the, that's exactly what's going on in the psalm. How can you not see that? <laughs> David's the one that did all this. God's the one that said, I'm going to judge you for what you've done. And then when it happens, David cries out and God shows him mercy. He's, he shows him mercy and we can be shown mercy even when we're responsible for the situation that we are in under one condition, if we're merciful unto others. If we're merciful unto others, God will give us mercy too. But don't go around having an un, you know, a merciless spirit just holding everybody's feet to the fire over everything that they do and then expect God to show you mercy when you need it. It's not going to be there. 
I believe David was shown mercy here because in times past he was known as one who showed mercy himself. And here's the thing, we're all going to need that one day. So what should our attitude be? We should be a merciful people. Let's go ahead and pray.